Hi everybody, welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to be looking at drawing graphs. Now, this particular video can be used for any high school learner of any grade. It's going to cover all the rules for drawing a graph so that you can get full marks in your test and exams because I know this is always a problem. But also it's going to focus in on which graph are you supposed to draw for which information because I think that's the thing we struggle the most with and we always wonder, am I drawing the right graph for this particular piece of information? Now, if you are new here, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like on this video. I post every Tuesday and Thursday. If you're in grade 11 and 12 and you're looking for that extra little bit of help, you should think about getting my study guide, which is available on missangler.co.za under my shop. Um, and also, if you're in matric and you're thinking about um, perhaps having a little bit of extra help from me, um, live lessons, uh, choosing the next video that comes out, exam prep, if that sounds good to you, then maybe you should think about joining my membership. So let's get into the video. Now, when we speak about drawing graphs, there are some really important things that we need to keep in mind every time we draw any kind of graph. So before we get into the specifics of each kind of graph you're going to draw, we need to look at the most common rules. Now, these rules are set in stone. And I mark final matric papers at the end of the year, so I know exactly what the markers are looking for and what we are awarding marks for and what we take them away. So when it comes to drawing any kind of graph, we always start off with some kind of heading and it must have both sets of variables in it. So it must have the independent and the dependent variable. Those variables must then link to the actual graph itself, but I'm going to come back to that. Now, the heading is generally written at the top of the graph. Now, this particular one uh, doesn't have a very well-worded um, heading. Your heading should always say something like graph uh, showing absorbance versus concentration or the rate at which um, absorbency happens based off of how concentrated the solution is. And in that heading, you're also going to tell the marker what kind of graph. Is it a bar graph, a line graph, a histogram? What is it? The next thing that's really important is you should be drawing your axes in pen. Um, and the reason for that is it makes it a lot easier to mark. It's clearer. And pencil can often be quite difficult to read, especially if you've rubbed it out many times. Now, another important thing that we make a mistake is we don't actually draw interval lines at each point. Now, what do I mean by interval lines at each point? If we have a look at the little example graph on the side here, you will see that when we were drawing this graph, we included these lines with our actual pen. Now, for some reason, people leave these off and they rely on the graph paper or they rely on the blue lines that are already on the page for them. And that's not a good idea. You need to make those lines yourself when you are drawing it. Um, and they need to be very clear and they need to go across the actual axes themselves. The next thing that you need to keep in mind is you need to have labels for your X and Y. Now, um, there is a rule. On the x-axis, that is where you will have your independent variable. It is the thing that you are testing versus the dependent variable on the y, which um, is the thing that you're measuring. Now, um, you'll also notice that these particular two um, labels have their unit of measurements in brackets, as you can see here, and you must do that as well. Um, you must put the unit of measurement in bracket if it does have one. And um, we always place the independent and dependent variables um, on these fixed places. We don't swap them around. You do run the risk of losing a plotting mark if you swap them around. And often what happens is you can sort of see that you've done something wrong because you look at your graph and you go, mm, this doesn't look quite right. The graph seems to be going sideways instead of from left to right. And often what happens is, if I just quickly show you, if you've drawn the graph correctly, you know, and you've placed your points like this, 
when you join the points, they seem to progress how you would naturally assume them to. However, if you draw a graph the wrong way around, sometimes what happens is you end up with points that are all in line with each other and they sort of do this. And it doesn't seem like they're progressing forwards, but rather they're going down. And that's a good indication of the fact that you've actually plotted these the wrong way around. You swapped the um, axes and you've put them the wrong way. So let's try and avoid that. Now, there's one other thing I want to just quickly show you before I go through each of the different kinds of graphs and I tell you what to look out for and what to do. And that is when you are drawing the axes of your graph right in the beginning and you're using your ruler, my suggestion to you is when you are drawing that x-axis line, so that bottom line, this one here, and you've drawn now your y going this way, right? This is always going to be zero in the corner here, always, always, always. Um, and when you are drawing these lines and you are putting the interval lines in, if you are going by tens or twenties or ones or twos, it doesn't matter. But what I suggest you do is you also put the in-between values. So if this is me drawing my intervals and this is one, two, three, and four, it's a really good idea to also include the in-between intervals too. And I'm going to show you why now in the next few slides as to why that is a good idea because it makes spacing perfect and it, run, and it means that you won't get any marks taken away for your drawing and plotting of your graph. So let's get into the first kind of graph that you may interact with, and that is a line graph. So when do we use a line graph? We use line graphs for continuous data on the x-axis. And so what that means is if we're measuring something in time or length or weight, it means it is a measurement that has in-between values. So that means between the hour one and hour two, there is time that's in between those two. Or maybe between 10 kilograms and 20 kilograms, there is weight in between those two set points. And so we need to be able to um, plot those points and see what sits in between those values. Now, um, I have a good example on the left-hand side here of what a um, line graph would look like. And I'm going to just cover some of the really important rules that go along with line graphs. Now, um, you still draw them with the same axes and the heading and et cetera, like we mentioned before. But again, and I really want to stress this, you must provide these interval lines. And remember, when I talk about interval lines, I'm talking about the following, these little black lines over here. Now, this particular graph is missing them, so I'm putting them in myself. But remember earlier on, I also said to you it's a good idea to include the in-between values. And that's actually going to be even more useful for when we do our bar graph. But I suggest you do it on a line as well. You'll never go wrong by putting these lines in yourself. The next thing is your intervals must always be the same in space. And what I mean by that is if you are spacing everyone out by a centimeter, then make sure all of them are spaced out by centimeters and that you don't go one centimeter and then half a centimeter and then two centimeters must be the same. We mark those intervals with pen, which we've done here now. And if we do need a key, you must provide a key. Now, here are some helping sort of helpful tips on the keys that you must provide. Now, in this graph here alongside, we don't need a key because there is only one line. But what happens if we go in now and I plot a second line? And now we need to tell the difference between these two line graphs. And I'm just going to make the dots a little bigger so you can see them. Those are the points. So when making a, uh, a key for this, what you're going to need to do is you are going to need to use a shape to tell the difference between them. And your shape must go around the dots. So I would make this maybe the circle key. So I put a circle around each one like that. And then maybe the one I've just drawn for you now, I put squares around it, each point. 
And in my key, I will literally have the dot with the circle and the dot with the square. And then I will tell you what those are when I write out what the key is. And that's how we're going to use a key. We're not going to use colors, okay? When you join your points, you need to join them with a ruler. Um, it depends on what kind of graph you are making, but generally it is with a ruler. I know in mathematics and in physics, there are times where you freehand graphs, but for life sciences and biology, we're going to do it with a ruler. And the most important thing I want to remind you is do not, I repeat, do not join the line to the axes if there is no zero value. So what does that mean, everybody? Let me just take away all of the lines on this picture. What it means is the following. If you look at this graph, you will see the first point over here is not touching the axes. That is because the first value is at 1 and at 60. Okay, there is no zero value. There's no zero and 40 or zero and 60. Because if there was that value, then you would plot the first point over here and then you would draw the line over. But because there isn't that value, it doesn't exist in this graph and in the table they will give you, you are not going to plot it. So there's no need to just extend this line like randomly off to the side and whatever you know direction you want we don't want to do that right let's then move in to bar graphs now bar graphs we are going to use bar graphs when we get discontinuous data and discontinuous data is often often seen as like a category so things like colors blood groups individual people and any other kind of category that you can think of where there aren't in between values is going to be a bar graph um, now there are some little extras that we must remember with a bar graph that we don't need to worry about as much when we do a line graph um, and that has to do with the actual drawing of the bar graph now we do the same always draw the axes and pen heading all of those things but what's really important as I mentioned earlier is you must 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 provide interval lines in the middle of the bar and what does that look like let's look at the graph on the long side here we have we have here is amount of children and then the type of their pets in the middle of each of these bars must appear an interval line. If you don't put that interval line in the middle, then you're not going to get the mark. Not only do you need to have that line in the middle of each bar, you also need to have interval lines in between the bars, which means there needs to be an interval line there and one there and so on and so forth. So going back to my original piece of advice, that is why you want to plot as many of those interval lines as possible, including the in-between values. You must make sure your bars are all the same size and the same width apart. So if you have a look alongside here, you will see that the width of these bars from left to right is the same for all, and the distance between each bar is the same. Now, if you do need to plot many bars um, next to one another, you can provide a key, but only when it's necessary. Now, this particular one doesn't actually even need to have any kind of key. You don't even have to color it in. You only really need a key for a bar graph if you're doing like a double bar graph where you have like a before and after bar, which would be like um, if this was the bar graph, we have a before bar and then an after bar, and they actually touch one another. And so you would need to color coordinate them or give them a pattern, and that's when you need a key. Now, I suggest to actually use a pattern rather than color in an exam. And uh, the first bar must not touch the axes. This is very important. And so we can actually see this if we look at the diagram alongside. There is no bar here. We leave that area open. Now let's move into more of like an elusive graph, a graph that we're never really sure when we need to use. And it's actually quite simple if you just keep this in your head. We use histograms when we are plotting ranges or averages and these averages are continuous, which is often why we by accident draw a line graph instead of a bar. 
but they are continuous within an category and that's why they get a little bit tricky so histograms are used mostly with ranges so from one month to one year and that's the range or from age zero to age 10 and then from age 11 to age 20 and then we average out the total and that's what you can actually see in the histogram below and that's what they've done there we have ages 0 to 10 and then 11 to 20 and 21 to 30 and so on. And those are averages. And then they've drawn a bar. Now, um, histograms are less common than any other graph that we're going to be drawing. Um, but there are still some rules that we need to follow when we draw them. So let's have a look at those. So first things first, uh, to use these, we need to be plotting generally a range. Um, or an average that is in categories. So like if we did average rainfall per month in a year, we would use a histogram because we would calculate the rainfall from the 1st of January to the 31st of January. And then we would calculate that average. And then we do the same for February and all the months. But we don't use a line graph because um, averages cannot represent specific points you know, like a dot you've got to think of it like an average is from the beginning of the bar to the end of the bar but the problem is time is continuous so we can't let our bars be separate they need to touch so the histogram is the best of both worlds continuous and discontinuous information being represented at the same time so keeping that in mind all your bars must touch the first bar must touch the axes, which you can see here on the diagram. This first bar is touching the axes. All the bars must be the same size. And we still follow the same rules for all bar graphs, drawing those interval lines. If we make them a little bit darker here, we can see there are our interval lines showing where our bar ends and begins. Now, last but definitely not least, pie charts, dreaded pie charts. And we dread them because they actually take the most time to construct, they require the most skill and the most equipment. And so that's why they're also, again, not necessarily a graph we come across very often in exams, but they do come up, so we need to be prepared. So when do we use a pie chart? Well, a pie chart is showing us parts of a whole. Often they've given us a percentage of some kind, like they're saying, 65% of people have this eye color and 25% of people have this eye color. So it's parts of a whole population. Another example I said here was like fossil fuel production of each country in the world. We would be able to then make a country a slice of the pie and we'd be able to see that in a pie chart. Now, as I mentioned to you, pie charts require a lot of skill and equipment. And so let's have a look at the rules that go along with pie charts amongst all the other already mentioned rules in the other graphs. First things first, you must draw your pie chart with a protractor and a compass. The compass is what makes the circle and the protractor is what allows you to measure other degrees. You must show all your calculations. And this is very important. And we forget to do this. We just sort of guess. We go, oh, well, that's 50%. So I know that's half the circle. So I'm just going to draw half the circle and hope for the best. You must show me your calculations. Now, there are two ways that you can go about doing this. Um, you'll always need the percentage. So step one, calculate the percentage if it's not given because you're going to need it because you're going to have to write it in the in the table, uh, excuse me, in the pie chart at some point. Then what you do is you take that percentage. And I know it seems like you're going backwards and then forwards, but I'll show you both ways. You're going to divide your percentage by 100 and then multiply it by 360 and you'll get your degrees that you're going to plot. Or what you can do is you divide the portion by the total, which let's say I've got 35 out of 50, and then I multiply it by 360. And now that's going to give me my answer in degrees that must be then used to plot those segments. Now, um, when we are plotting those segments, what that basically means is we are plotting these sections over here. Now, what you're going to need to do is you will have a starter point where you would have drawn your um, uh, circle with the compass. And it will often be a dot in the center. So you're going to line up your protractor 
and often it's a 180 degree protractor so it's going to go right down the middle and you are going to read the degrees all the way around and you'll see oh okay well that one is there so I plot that point and I draw that line in there okay and then I do the same and I move my protractor over now and I draw this line and this segment and so on and so forth and now I have my pie chart right now these are the next important things we actually don't do when we lose marks so we don't end up writing uh, any of the percentages in the sectors which as you can see in the picture here we have done that and that you must do that and most importantly we must provide a key now that key often just sort of sits up at the top over here and we have the color or the patterns and we have a little description of what these things are. Now, I generally tell my students to please use a pattern rather than a color when you are doing this by hand. So rather do a pattern of some kind. And um, the key, as I mentioned, must contain the labels for each of the sections that you have done. So in other words, what does the green mean? What does the orange? What does the blue, etc.? What do they stand for? What are they representing? And that's it for today's video. If you liked this video and you want to keep seeing more of them, make sure that you are subscribed with your notifications turned on. I make so much content for my senior grades and now I'm moving into more of the junior content as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and I will see you all again soon. Bye.